Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Another Dime in the Jukebox. Today, my guest is Kevin Cottage, who is a drum, um, a drummer, a drum and instructor, and he has an extensive experience in the music industry. Hi, Kevin. How are you today? Great. How are you doing? Thanks I'm for good. Thanks. How are you? No problem. No problem at all. Good. So, uh, so what inspired you to start playing drums in the first place? Like, what got you into music? Yeah, that was a bit of an extensive question, oddly enough, because I officially started when I was seven. But my parents actually have a uh, video camera footage of me, like in diapers, just like banging on like random household objects. And then at one point, <laughs> my uncle got me like a pair of bongos, so I'd be like in bongo in diapers, you know, hitting bongos and quarter notes. <laughs> and music was on. I don't come from a musical family. I'm actually kind of the first one in my family to pursue music in any way. Um, but my dad was a big music fan in particular, more so than my mom. So he would always have music on anything ranging from like Zeppelin to Deep Purple to the Beach Boys to uh, he was actually oddly enough into some country. So sometimes he'd play the Oak Ridge Boys, too, in the house. And I, I really dug them at the time as well. Um, and then officially what got me into drumming was my elementary school um, every holiday season um, you know, it was a Christian school. So like every holiday season, they would have like this kind of like little kid Christmas play program thing. So like all first through third graders had to participate in some level. So the theme for my grade, which was first grade at the time was the Muppets. And because of my vibrant red hair, guess which character they cast me as? I was never a big Muppets fan. So honestly, I have no idea. Okay, gotcha. Well, <laughs> animal. <laughs> Like, animal they cast me as animal who was the drummer in the muppet show band so i would watch footage of of animal playing drums on the muppet show and i was i was like totally sold i'm like i want to do that i'm in so around age seven i started on like snare drum lessons for about six months and then after about six months i kind of graduated from that into drum set lessons so that teacher hooked me up with a friend of his from berkeley school of music who was a drum set instructor and i never looked back after that nice nice oh my gosh you got your certain music like so early on like i didn't even get passionate well i didn't really get really interested in in vocals until i was about 15 interesting and then, yeah and then that after uh <clears throat> I don't know, like over the next couple of years, like when I was in high school, that passion kind of came to a halt until I was about 25, gotcha. and hanging out around musicians a lot in, in LA. So yeah, but you got your start like so early on and you're stuck with it. So that's awesome. Oh, what, out of curiosity, what triggered your interest in, in vocals? Like around 15? Um, so um, <clears throat> the first time around when I was like 14, 15, I would listen to a lot of music. Like I would listen to music whenever I would go like on the trip with my parents or whenever like either one of my parents would like drive me somewhere, I would always have my CD player with me. When I was 15, I started jogging a lot and I would listen to a lot of pop music. And also I would listen to like mixes that my stepdad made for me when I was a kid. Oh, cool. And so a lot of the songs that I've listened to, I would be like, oh my gosh, like I just really love the way this sounds. Like I love the vocals. I love the lyrics. I love like the general vibe of the song. Mm -hmm. I remember specifically when I was 15, I discovered uh, Hanson for the first time. You know, those guys who did- oh, sure. Sure, sure, yeah. they did. They did a lot of really great stuff ever since. And when I was in the 10th grade, I discovered their album called This Time Around, which came out in like 2000, 2002, maybe. Okay. Yeah. And I've listened to that a lot. And I think the reason why I mentioned that is because I have recently rediscovered that album like five months ago or something. And I'm currently learning the songs from it in my vocals class. So I mean, honestly, like, like I said, I discovered them for the first time when I was 15 and now I'm 31 and it still holds up apparently. Sure. Right on. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, and uh, when I was around 25, you know, after I graduated college, all of a sudden I started to have, like, a lot more time to go out and, like, explore L.A., and so I mm. started going out to see a lot of um, live shows. At the time, I just started being a huge fan of Cherie Curry from The Runaways because I have read her biography when I was, like, 21. When I was 23, I met her for the first time in person, and I got to see her play live oh, at the New Year's Eve party. And the atmosphere of the whole event is just so amazing that it inspired me to go and check out more live music. There you go. Yeah, so that's how I got into it. Like, I saw those people on stage with music, and I was like, I really want to do that. Awesome. There you go. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, were drums the first instrument you ever played? Officially, yeah. I mean, I remember when I was, I think probably around four or five, um, I got one of those, like, little kid guitars. And, like, it's funny, I always, like, when I thought of rock stars, I typically would think of guitar players. And I think a part of me kind of secretly always wanted to be a guitar player. But in terms of actual playing, yeah, drums were my first instrument. Definitely. I see. Nice. Nice. <laughs> uh, and what was the very first band that you played in? First band ever? So, okay, like my... Uh, elementary and middle school like they had a music program but it wasn't like particularly emphasized it was definitely more of like an athletic kind of school mm -hmm. um <clears throat> so we had the school kind of had an unofficial band um one of the dads who was a bass player who played with a bunch of different bands in the 70s including gino vanelli mm -hmm. his son went there um and and he kind of inadvertently started like the unofficial school band so we would play all kinds of school events and it was interesting too because i was the baby of the group i was in like fourth or fifth grade while everyone else was in like seventh and eighth grade mm -hmm. and uh, so that was like the first like gigging experience though it was more in a nurturing environment my first like gigging band outside of like school ground so to speak uh i, I it was like 10th grade maybe it was a band called fez armada totally out there eccentric project um that i think was just too out there for most people to handle to be honest but it was uh that at the time this band mars volta was really kind of starting to blow up mm -hmm. and it was like in the general vein of that where it was like this rock fusion with a little bit of latin influence um it was i would classify it as that general vibe pretty psychedelic and out there mm -hmm. I see. I see. Well, like I said, you started out early. And uh, yeah, it's definitely really cool that you got your experience, like your very first experience at such a young age. Yeah, like when I was a kid, I did a lot of different stuff. I took ceramics when I was like nine. I took painting and around the same time. When I was 12, I <laughs> tried to write my own um, Lord of the Rings biop. Well, <clears throat> It wasn't a biopic. What do you call um what was Fifty Shades of Grey? It was like a Twilight Oh um, like an adaptation? Movie. Yes, like a fanfic. That's what I was doing. Okay. That's yeah. dope. I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan too, so that's dope. <laughs> I used to be when I was a kid. Honestly, not so much anymore these days. Uh, the whole series, like, it's definitely really visually pleasing, but honestly, I feel like, like, now that I'm older, I feel like it lacks, um, you know, like, heart and backstory, and not necessarily backstory, but it just doesn't really seem, like, real and authentic to me anymore. Oh, you mean, what, the Rings of Power show? Yeah, I never, oh. I don't even watch that. Like, honestly, to me, that, <laughs> the whole franchise is basically just a whole bunch of, you know, computer generated armies i mean like the visuals are definitely really good like they're solid sure. but there's really not that much to the story so, yeah I, the, the the real magic was in the the, the original trilogy I, i'm with you on that yeah <laughs> I, I enjoyed the ring of power like i expected to hate it more than i did but i agree with you so far it doesn't have the same magic that the the original trilogy did i'm, I'm with you on that yeah, I think that when I was a kid, I was so obsessed with it that honestly, I remember it like so well that nowadays there wouldn't really even be any need for me to check it out. If I did check it out, I would probably get a kick out of it for like five minutes. <laughs> right. But it would. 
it wouldn't really last like, any longer than that. I remember that when I was in sixth grade. I I was also a huge fan of the uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean movie, like mm. the one that came out. I have recently I recently saw it again, and I gotta say Johnny Depp's acting is definitely like superb. However, I wasn't really all that impressed by it. I mean, yeah, like the graphics were good, like they were really solid. The fighting scenes were fun, but. I wouldn't really watch it like more than once. Really, the meaning the the first movie? Yeah, the first one. The, That's the, interesting. That was I, I have the opposite feeling. That one actually has stood the test of time for me. I yeah, I love the first one. I really like the second one, and then the rest are kind of like just kind of didn't need to be made. The third one was kind of a mess. Like they should have <laughs> had a completed script before they started filming that one, but um that's interesting though yeah that 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 first movie didn't stand the test of time for you because for me it actually totally did i saw it again about four or five months ago and really? yeah yeah not necessarily for me i mean like i did enjoy like i said the first time that i saw it like recently but i probably wouldn't even see the first one i would definitely go for something by tarantino because i would definitely see glorious bastards again it's been like four or, like maybe three or four years since the last time I saw it, and I'm a huge Tarantino fan. Like, I love Pulp Fiction. I love Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah. And, but I would definitely love to see Glorious Bastards sometime again. I've never seen that one. I know, it's shocking. I, it's, it's on my watch list. I do it's need pretty to cool. That one. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, you should definitely watch it. So, um, can you tell me a little bit about your past <clears throat> music experiences? Like, uh, like as a professional, you mean? As a professional musician, yes. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the tr interesting thing about this industry that makes it really tricky to navigate is like, there really isn't like a set um, formula for how to make it, quote unquote, because everyone's story is different. And everyone's uh, story is not only different, but oftentimes their success stories will contradict each other. So I've kind of taken all approaches at different periods. So I've, I've worked as a session guy or a hired gun for different bands. I've been a full-time official member of different bands. Um, I've sometimes just worked at, in a studio and sometimes just worked live. <clears throat> so it's been very kind of up and down and unpredictable, but I'd say some notable moments thus far have been, um, in 2009, 2010, I was in this band called Thunder City Shout, and it, that was produced by Mike Percaro. Um, if you're not familiar with that name, Mike Percaro was best known as the bassist of Toto, and oh. Toto were comprised of a bunch of session guys who also were co-writers with like Michael Jackson and like a whole mess of like big time pop and soul and R&B artists. Um, so that was a really, really interesting experience. So for a good two years of my life there, <clears throat> um, you know, I got to record in some legendary studios with that band. And we uh, we didn't really make it too far outside of L.A. Like there were talks of going to Europe and on uh, on tour opening for Toto. And uh, there were talks of going to Germany to record an album. And those things didn't really pan out. But um, locally, we would play a bunch of big shows. And then we'd sometimes do uh, festival dates. And that was really, really an amazing experience at the time. And then the following year, I joined a band called Edge of Paradise, who was Re relatively unknown at the time but uh i was with them for about 11 months like just shy of a year um and that was interesting because we had a pr guy like and he was like the heavy metal north american pr guy meaning like when metallica would tour north america this was the guy they used mm -hmm. when iron maiden would tour north america this is the guy they used and uh, so it was kind of like this back engineering issue because we were getting a lot of press in the metal world, like worldwide, and we were getting a fan base in, in places that are kind of obscure for that. So like we were getting fan bases in like Vietnam and Thailand oh, wow. and um, Ireland. And then of course, all the pl places that traditionally do embrace heavy metal too. So like we were getting fan bases in Norway and Sweden and Denmark and Germany and the UK and all of that. Um, but the, the issue we kept running into was uh, we didn't really have the funding to go tour the places that were really excited about us. So we were kind of stuck in the SoCal scene at the time. Um, my involvement with them didn't, like I said, didn't last more than 11 months. But since then, they really have kind of blown up 
um, on the underground scene. So like a couple of years ago, I know they toured all over Europe. They've toured Europe several times, but they were opening for uh, Sonata Arctica, who was like a gigantic band out of Finland. Oh my goodness. Uh, and uh, I, I, when people watch the Grammys, apparently they only show like the last part of the Grammys, which is for all the like big, you know, top 40 pop stuff. Mm -hmm. But the whole ceremony is apparently like eight hours long. And uh, they were nominated, this was like 2016, 2017, I want to say, they were actually nominated for some Grammy. So they've gone on and, and done some amazing things. Um, and then other than that, I, I, I was in this band called Sawtell, um, which started with the singer guitar player. And uh, when I, at the time I had stepped in, there were already some songs that were written. And um, at that time I had started my own recording studio and once we got these really hip arrangements down and started co-writing and everything <clears throat> we recorded the whole album at my studio and then i mixed and mastered it and it, this is one of those tragic music industry tales is that just as things were about to take off because we did have some deals on the table unfortunately it all kind of came to a head and imploded on itself out of respect for the other members of the band, I won't really go into the details as to why it imploded on itself. Um, but basically, um, that's an album I'm super proud of. The album's called The Perfect Search. So if you just Google Sawtell, The Perfect Search, it, you can hear it. It'll show up on like SoundCloud and Bandcamp and stuff like that. Um, other than that, some big time session stuff I've done. Like uh, a couple of years ago, I did record on the um cobra kai soundtrack cobra oh kai is yeah oh my god that's awesome I'm such a it was super fun yeah the they, they oh. composed like a really cool video game soundtrack uh -huh. like very much like almost like final fantasy meets like tr like classic 80s heavy metal like really really cool soundtrack um and over the past few years i started my own band and and recorded the first ep and then ran out of money um I think what a lot of the general public may not understand about the modern music industry is that there are actually two different music industries happening that aren't really that interconnected. So on one hand, you have like the old music industry, which is like the old uh, system of the label funds things. And uh, but you're on their schedule and they have an input sort of like in the final product, so to speak. And then you have the independent music industry. And I've had a lot more involvement in the independent industry which is you know you do it yourself which is great it has its perks because whoever is writing the music really ultimately has the say so and there isn't that label pressure but what is lacking most of the time is the proper funding to make it happen so over the past like seven years i've recorded a whole mess of albums not just for my own music but also for other artists and most of it just hasn't seen the light of day yet um but uh, uh some interesting stuff is coming out i uh, did recently record for some other video game stuff i'm not allowed to talk about yet they had me sign an nda but mm -hmm. when i can talk about it i will um but yeah no I, I got my own project that i'm super proud of but like i said i ran out of funding largely because of a trademark dispute and that kind of ate up a good chunk of the budget but i have another two albums written and once uh i'm able to secure the proper funding to make it happen and promote it properly i'm definitely going to get right back to recording that and making that happen that band is called dark moon tragedy you could hear the ep it's everywhere except apple music Nothing against Apple, but the trademark dispute made it very difficult to re-upload the same music again under a different name. I see. Well, um, I mean, I will definitely check out that album on Spotify. Um, I'm really excited to hear it. And I will, um, I mean, I hope I'll like it. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, cool. yeah, I'll definitely check it out. Okay. Gosh, well, you definitely have had a really extensive experience and uh it sounds to me like you're on your way to, you know, moving up and hopefully Hope so. <laughs> Thank you. Soon, you will definitely be involved in a very successful project. Thank you. So, uh, so what bands are you involved with right now, whether it's full time or part time and how long have you been with each band? Okay, so there's my own band, which is basically on hiatus, Dark Moon Tragedy, just like I said, because of the lack of funding. I started that pretty almost immediately after Sawtell came to an end, which was like towards the end of 2017. So I started writing right around that time, and I, you know, I took my time with it, 
and uh, I think the EP came out in 20, 2020, I want to say, something like that, 2021 maybe. Um, it originally came out in 2019, and then the trademark dispute happened, and that ate up a, a bunch of time. Um, so that's been going off and on since 2017. Um, I've been playing in this fun kind of cover band project uh, called Soul ID, which is we just play local gigs. Um, it's it's a fun project. It's the guitar player Dylan. He's a really eccentric player. He's out there, and um, the whole like concept of the band is that we do these classic R and B covers, uh, classic and modern R and B covers, but we come up with our own arrangements. And then oftentimes when we hit the stage, we change them on the fly. Oh. So, <laughs> yeah. So basically, so it's like almost there's no point in rehearsing because whatever arrangement we came up with, it's going to change automatically as soon as we hit the stage <laughs> where it's like, you know, it, which is cool for our musicianship because it keeps us all on our toes. But oftentimes, like, I'll be anticipating like, okay, we're going to jump into a bridge now. And then he'll turn to me. You'll be like solo. I'm like, okay, we're doing that now, apparently. <laughs> um Pretty but it's fun improvised yeah yeah no but it's it's a it's a fun project um and i haven't spent a lot of time in in cover bands like that's like one side of the industry i've, I've kind of limited experience on so that's been a lot of fun and then this is another project that's kind of on hold until the the funding is secure called shadow logic Mm -hmm. uh, my friend who goes by the stage name chuck chilla he has a couple different bands he has this like solo music which is more like r b pop with a little bit of reggae influence and then he has like chuck chill and the vibe providers which i think is more of a cover band type project which i'm not involved in either um but then he has this other band called shadow logic which is more rock alternative rock with a little bit of metal influence so that album kind of like with me and dark moon tragedy he just takes his time with everything so i i have some of those songs i recorded like seven years ago like oh. back back when i was in sawtell like that's how long ago some of that was um uh, but he did finally put out the first album called um speed of dark or uh, i don't remember speed of dark or speed of the dark but yeah it's everywhere it's on all of the uh, platforms so that he put out the first of what's probably going to be at least four or five because i've recorded at least 20 songs for him at this point um, he put that out and now it's just a matter of kind of playing the waiting game on in terms of him getting the proper funding and as soon as he has the proper funding he definitely wants to book some shows locally and then I think even take it on tour. Um, so we'll see I have no idea when that will materialize but um, that that project's been in the works since I want to say around 20 probably 2016 maybe 2017 something like that. Um, and then other than that, just like random recording sessions, totally just sporadic, like, you know, some months I get hit with a bunch of them. Some months I'll get hit with like one of them, very unpredictable, some video game soundtrack kind of stuff. Uh, this one guy hit me up recently from Berkeley college of music who wanted like some drum tracks to edit on. Like, uh, one was a reggae song. The other one was more of a hip hop kind of track. Um, and, uh, a lot of stuff that I've recorded over the past few years that hasn't seen the light of day yet, but when it does, I'm sure I'll be getting the calls to either play shows or, you know, uh, record more music. We'll see. It's very unpredictable. I see. Well, you definitely have a lot going on right now. And, um, hmm. Yeah, it looks like you're on your way to creating some really big projects. Yeah, hopefully. It's snail space, but get yeah. out. it'll get there eventually. Yeah, hopefully the stuff that you have been working on for like years and years already, um, hopefully some of it will see the light of day soon. I mean, it has been a really long time. And obviously, yeah. you still keep those projects like close to heart. Like they really matter to you. Otherwise, you would have like sure. them long ago. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so good luck. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, <clears throat> um, are you currently giving like any private lessons as a drum instructor? Oh, yeah. That's actually been my main priority for, for a while now. As much as I hate to admit it, the teaching thing is way more consistent in terms of pay than like anything else I've done. So that's um, that's actually kind of taken the front seat for the time being. Um, so I've actually been teaching um, freelance since like age 19 i've been at it a long time oh wow and, and then once the pandemic thing happened everything shut down 
And for the first time ever, like I've known other instructors who have had a lot of luck in the online teaching thing and be able to, being able to pull students from other states or other countries. But everyone up to that point always wanted to stu- who wanted to study with me were always local. So I never really tapped into that side of the teaching market until uh, you know everything shut down. So basically, um, I was able to start pulling some students from other states and a couple from Canada and then I had one student from Australia for a bit. And um, since then, I have hired um, this marketing guy in, in the UK. Uh, the fact that he's from the UK is not really that relevant, but you know what he sounds like when he talks, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, uh, I hired him and he's basically kind of walked me through um, the process of how to market online lessons. And wow, it's really extensive. <laughs> it's a, it's a bit more of an undertaking than I initially expected, but uh, basically I run this Facebook group um, and he suggested that I do it genre specific, even though the content in there really isn't that genre specific. But basically I run this Facebook group called, you know, become a great classic metal drummer in 60 days, which again, is just marketing lingo. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I post uh, different content in there, you know, four to five times a week. Sometimes it's like free trainings. Sometimes it's a testimonial from a current or former student. Sometimes it's actually a shout out to a classic metal drummer. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically the whole idea is that it's like subliminal marketing in a way, because like the more you post to this market, the more your credibility is developed. And then when people start reaching out and asking questions or you engage them in conversation, it's like, oh, book a free consultation call with me. And then, you know, if it goes well and they seem super interested, then you bring up sort of your different teaching programs. Um, So that's been, I've I've been snagging a few more students that way. And then this week I'm gonna start running ads for local lessons again too, which is now becoming an even trickier thing to navigate than it used to be um but yeah no actually once uh part of the motivation behind really prioritizing that is if once i have that consistent income for myself i'll have more money to pour into my own music and be able to um you know hire the musicians and market it appropriately without having to start and stop and start and stop you know yeah well it definitely seems like there is a lot of demand for drumming lessons it seems like you have a lot of requests for lessons and stuff and um <clears throat> there definitely seems to be you know um, a way for you to make an income in that oh yeah definitely yeah i'm pretty sure that yeah, you should definitely use you like try to get as many lessons as you can and then use all of the income you get from that in order to actually launch your own your own music Right. That's, that's the whole idea. And I'm, I'm discovering like sometimes it, like the teaching thing can, can have moments where it's as unpredictable as just being a musician. It's um, it's easier to like secure funding for it, though, because oftentimes they'll pay for like a month in advance or whatever. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, it's easier to regulate the income a little bit better than just being a freelance musician. Uh, but some months it's like, oh, yeah, I killed it this month. This is awesome. And then the next month it's like, oh, it's July and everybody goes on vacation and you're like, great <laughs> you know yeah it can be a little bit inconsistent then huh sure but it's you know it's like i said it's definitely way more consistent than just relying on income from doing music mm-hmm. and I, I i love teaching actually i always have since day one and um not to toot my own horn but i do think i have a natural gift for it because like after doing it for a while it's like at this point I don't have to even look at the student to know what they're doing wrong. I'm very big on teaching the whole like body mechanics and ergonomics and that sort of thing. And I can hear when they're just simply too stiff because they're not even getting the full resonance out of the kit. Um, And, you know, the more you do something, the better you get at it. And like I said, I've been doing it since I was 19 and I'm 34 now. And um, I do have like a pretty set um, teaching method now that seems to work pretty well universally. I mean, every student's a little bit different and learns a little differently, but um, wherever a student is, I'm like 10 steps ahead in terms of where I'm going to take them kind of thing. Well, I mean, if you you have been studying drumming since you were like, what, nine, seven, nine, eight years old? Seven, yeah. Yeah, you've been doing it for like pretty much your whole life. And if you're that skilled in something, there is absolutely no reason as to like why you shouldn't um, try to earn a living from it. Absolutely. Yeah, I have a number of friends, friends who are in bands who are <clears throat> like trying to make it on a bigger, bigger scale. 
Of course. Fact, yeah. my, um, I have a music blogger. I, I'm friends with a music blogger, and she and I have a mutual friend who is currently in the, he's been in, in this band for like since 2014, I'd say. And recently, my music blogger friend told me that um, our mutual friend who has a band should try to expand his horizons a little more. He's been mostly play, playing like in bars. Sure. For the past like what five six years that i've known him for and even though he does tour he tours in europe a lot he tours in japan a lot he has been to australia but most all the, awesome. the whole time he tours he mostly plays in like all of these like low-key bar type venues sure and then, yeah my blogger friend said that he should definitely expand his horizons a little more and try to play stadiums like try to be an opening act for someone yeah, because he has been doing this thing for like a really long time. So yeah, if you can swing that for sure, absolutely, it's worth the experience. It's it's one of those things that's like easier said than done. Like, oh yeah, just go play a stadium. Like, yeah. well, of course, like who wouldn't want to play a stadium, you know? Um, but yeah, I a lot of those tours when when you do play like big time stadiums and stuff like that, oftentimes the public doesn't know this, but for at least the last decade, maybe longer a lot of those situations you actually buy onto the tour mm -hmm. Not like some of the venues here in la that do the pay to play thing oftentimes to get on a big tour like that it's like you buy onto the tour and then kind of hope to make the money back through merch sales and stuff like that to the point where it's some of the pricing is so outrageous that it's almost not worth doing but if it's a decent enough deal like one that doesn't <laughs> cause you to have a heart attack of like oh no am i ever going to be able to pay rent again then yeah totally worth it. I mean, Edge of Paradise, I remember back when I was with them, we almost bought onto a tour where we'd opened directly for Judas Priest. Um, and yeah, it would have been an amazing experience, I'm sure. But and it, it, I'm not blaming the band. I don't think they have anything to do with it. This is all like management and like lawyers and stuff behind closed doors. But the price to buy onto this tour was just so outrageous, where even I as young, because I, I was like, what? 21 22 i was you know i was a kid idealistic ready to take on the world but the pricing was so outrageous that even i as a 21 year old was like yeah i don't think that's realistic um but yeah with your friend if he can actually find a deal that is manageable yeah it's worth an experience for sure yeah i think that the main problem is just like trying to actually get him to try to play more stadiums because like i said he has been doing he has been touring for years i have known him since 2017. sure throughout that whole time he tours like all the time like he is literally only in california for like two weeks out of every, every month and then he gotcha. goes tour again and recently like like i said because whenever he does play in town we do hang out but um, I don't really get to like talk to him all that much, especially about like his music experiences, because um, when he plays a show, it's like I go to the club, I listen to him play, we hang out for a bit, we chat, we drink, and then we go our separate, separate ways. So it's not like I had like a lot of opportunities to find out about like what his musical experiences are like. But my friend who's a music blogger, first of all, she... Um, I think she understands the, the modern music industry like a bit more than I do, actually a lot more than I do. And so she was the one who told me that like, you know, um, our friend really isn't living up to his full potential. So hopefully he will definitely get the motivation to get his music more out there and play someplace other than just like bars. Sure. Yeah, totally. Totally. Mm hmm yeah okay um and so and the last question uh <laughs> is what's next in your agenda do you have like any special projects coming up or anything like that um nothing that i haven't really already mentioned uh i mean my main baby and the thing that i would be most proud of in the future would be the dark moon tragedy stuff i have two full albums already fully written um and i'm really excited to get on recording and and mixing and mastering all that and getting that out to the world. Um, so that would be my, like sort of my baby project um, where like I'm kind of in the driver's seat and I'm in control of sort of where it's headed. Um, I would 
Yeah, I can't wait to put that out there. It's one of those things I'm taking my time with it because it all really just comes down to adequate funding to really, because, you know, you want to pay your musicians well. And so they're all satisfied and want to keep working with you. And then you want to be able to pour a bunch of money into proper marketing to get that niche audience who That's would be interested in music. Um, and then other than that, like the, the main thing, at least from a financial perspective is at the moment, I'm really focusing on just like getting more students um, because that's going to be the funding for the music essentially. And then uh, whoever hits me up and it's a proper fit and um, you know, it pays decently enough. Um, I'm always stoked to take on other projects as, like, as I've gotten older. It's funny. Like when you start out and you've studied a lot of different styles of music, you know, you, you step into the industry thinking like, oh, I should market myself as like a jack of all trades type, right? Because that'll bring me more uh, opportunity. Actually, it's funny that it, for most of us, it actually ends up being the opposite. Meaning like if you put yourself out there specializing in something, then mm -hmm. you actually tend to get more work. Mm -hmm. So it's funny. I've started off kind of marketing myself as like, oh, I, I do most genres. And now when I put myself out there, I really just kind of keep it like... Mm -hmm rock metal and reggae mm -hmm. so and anyone from those genres or who mixes those genres that reaches out to me and it's like decent enough pay and like that's a good personality fit then yeah of course i'm always stoked to take on stuff like that but yeah musically my main thing would just be the dark moon tragedy stuff i see yeah yeah like in terms of like projects and whoever offers you work i feel like it's always better to like kind of like keep yourself in between you should definitely stick to a certain niche yes. uh, that you like specialize in when it comes to your projects however if someone offers you to do something that's a little bit out of your comfort zone if you're feeling the project then i say why not why not say yes to it Sure. Yeah, yeah, totally. My blogger friend recently asked me if I would be willing to like interview anyone who is not like a rock and roll musician per se. And I say I would definitely be open to that, even though like my blog specializes in rock and roll music specifically. But oh. I didn't see why there would be any reason why I wouldn't want to try to interview someone who like works with in a different genre. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when you like consider like the origins of things. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Like, I mean, so like so far in my, the Facebook group that I run, I've been focusing really on classic metal mm -hmm. era drummers. So drummers from like the seventies and eighties mm -hmm. so far, but eventually I'm definitely going to do a bit where I start doing these shout outs to these classic jazz drummers. Cause before rock and roll, you know, the, that first generation of rock drummers, Mm -hmm. they they got their influence from jazz drummers because they didn't have other rock drummers to look up to. They were just kind of doing their own thing. Yeah. So I'm definitely going to do a bit on like the origins of hard rock and heavy metal drumming and give shout outs to people like, you know, Buddy Rich and Gene Krupa and, um, you know, Elvin Jones and, you know, different jazz cats like that because that inadvertently was a, was a direct, influ indirect, and for some drummers, a more direct influence on what would later be classified as heavy metal drumming. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, absolutely. If, if it's, if you come across someone that's close enough to the rock genre or maybe an origin type of thing, yeah, I, I could see it fitting on your blog too. Why mm -hmm. not? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I definitely think so too. So uh, yeah, well, hmm. Kevin, we're going to add this for like, 57 minutes so okay. i say that that's a pretty good decent interview sure awesome well thanks again yeah. for having me thank you thank you so much for being on my show it's been such a pleasure having you and sure. i learned so much yeah my pleasure hopefully i wasn't too long-winded <laughs> no 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 you weren't not at all not cool. at all cool okay. thanks again for having me thank you for being on my show bye adios see ya <laughs>